Hey friends, Happy New Year. Covey here with another Infinity Train video. Before I begin, a spoiler warning. I'm gonna be going pretty deep into books one, two, and three of Infinity Train. As of recording this, we still don't have confirmation for book four, so please, please watch the show on HBO Max so it gets renewed. All right, now that you've watched all three current books, let's get to it. Infinity Train is easily my favorite show right now because it checks all the boxes on my list for what I think makes a great show. Amazing character-driven stories, rich sci-fi fantasy lore, and so much theory fuel. I have about a billion theories on Infinity Train. But I realized before I can start really digging into the numerous theories I have, we need to establish a solid foundation first. That's when I came up with the idea for this video, and a part two in the near future. This video is going to be a complete wrap up of everything that we know about the Infinity Train. And I mean like the actual Infinity Train itself. I'm gonna break down the 30 episodes of the show and everything that the creators Owen Dennis and Maddie Carapel have said online about the show so that we're all on the same page about what's been established as canon. This should give us a solid base to build our theories off of in the future. This video is broken into six parts. Return to your seats and strap in y'all. This is gonna be a long ride. Part one. What is the Infinity Train? And some basic facts. I'll start off by saying that there's obviously a lot that we don't know about the Infinity Train, which is why I'm also planning to make a part two to this video, which is going to be all of the questions that I still have about the train. But we still have a lot of pieces and clues that can at least help us somewhat answer this question. The Infinity Train is, well, an infinite train. It's a giant mechanical vehicle that appears to go on forever, Although we do see the engine of the train, so I suppose it's a fairly loose term of infinite. Each car of the train is a pocket universe, as described in this video promo and in the train documentaries. Pocket universe is one of those sci-fi terms that doesn't really mean much in reality. One one describes it as, Because each car on this train is like a pocket universe where anything can happen. A pocket on an old pair of jeans with wheels instead of leg holes and train stuff instead of seams. But I imagine the train cars are similar to the TARDIS in Doctor Who, which Owen Dennis has said is an inspiration for Infinity Train. Don't believe it. It's bigger inside than out. Yes. That's because the TARDIS is dimensionally transcendental. What does that mean? It means that it's bigger inside than out. One super quick side note since we're talking about Doctor Who, similarly to the TARDIS, the train is also a universal translator, which is very convenient for sci-fi stories like these that are meant to happen across multiple languages. Here's a lightning quick rundown of all the cars in order of when we see them in the show. Some of the names are unofficial that I came up with. In book one, we see the snow car, the grid car, the crossword puzzle car, the tiny wizard's car, the pinball car, the beach car, the instruments in space car, the cross-eyed ducks car, the monster mask car, the skeleton dungeon car, the corgi car, aka Corginia, the straight up Italy car. In Tulip's notebook, we also see a few of the cars that we've seen and additionally, the monkey bars car, the friendly eyeballs car, the mannequin car, the water car, the keyboard car, which could actually be the instruments car, the hold music car, the flying fish car, the kombucha car, and the bats instead of bees car with a question mark. It would have been great to actually see some of these. The crystal car, the dinosaur baseball car, the cat's car, the spa car, the unfinished car, aka the turtle college car, the jelly bean car, the chrome car, aka the mirror car, the bank car, the business chart car, Atticus also mentions a previous luau car, the ball pit car, and the engine. In the train documentaries, we see the green car, also seen in book two, the kaiju car, also seen in book two. One one also mentions a car with a water slide with barbecue sauce instead of water, the hill car, which is where Jesse starts his journey, the movie theater car, the minecart car, and the wedding cake car. In book two, we see the bunny warrior car, the canyon of the golden wing snakes car, also seen in book three, the jellyfish car, the carrot people car, the doily car, which Owen claims Mrs. Graham, Jesse's school's lunch lady, is stuck in. The black market car, the family tree car, which is Alan Dracula's home car. The map car, the toad car, which I guess is now just an impossible to open car. The parasite car, Sashay's runway fairway car, the food pyramid car, the lucky cat car, the mall car, the golden cubes car, the tape car, interestingly the only car where the pocket universe is projected on the outside, and the number car. 
In book three, we see the musical car, the jungle car, the undersea bubbles car, the debutante ball car, the shot chalet car, or the cat's cabin car in English, the color clock car, the campfire car, the hey ho woe car, the origami car, the pumpkin car, the cardboard box car, the pufferfish balloon car, and the sporting goods store car. And probably as a joke, Owen Dennis said Tulip washed her clothes in the lavanderia car, but hey, it might as well be canon. Of course, there are countless cars that we don't get to see in the show. The train is allegedly infinite after all. Owen Dennis even answered that by episode 8, Tulip has traveled through around 40 cars, and I imagine the other protagonists went through many cars as well. So there's a lot of the train that the characters have experienced that we as the audience didn't get to see. I'm going to talk more about the train cars later in the video as well. Some more basics about the train we should cover right up front as well is that it does seem to exist in the real world of the show, meaning that time passes normally on the train, people who experience the train go missing for however long they're gone while their loved ones are looking for them, and when they come back, they do retain the memories of their experiences. In fact, Owen and Maddie have said Tulip's disappearance probably made the local news, but that Jesse wouldn't have heard of it from Arizona. Also, I really do like the idea of former passengers meeting up after their experiences to form some kind of a support group. Passengers while on the train also need to eat and drink as normal, and also we know that the train can be a real danger. And passengers can absolutely die on the train, which is very obvious to us by the end of book 3. Why the train exists is one of the show's biggest mysteries, and one of the theories that I want to make another video about soon. But we are given a couple of explanations for what the purpose of the train is from a few different sources. Whether or not those sources are reliable, though, is another question. But here's what we do know. At the beginning of book two, once 1-1 is back in his position as conductor, he creates an introductory video meant for new passengers. In the video, he explains, And this is a train where you sort out your problems. How about that number on your hand? Huh? Pretty cool and green. Every passenger has one. The numbers are made by the train based on your life in order to help you have the most personalized experience we can offer. If you want to go home, get your number down to zero and poof, away you go. We also know that the train is extremely old. As Samantha the cat says in book three, she hasn't taken a vacation in 150 years and that the cabin car has been bone dry for centuries, which means the train is at least a few hundred years old, if not older. And Owen did confirm that this was in human years. Part two, how does the train pick up passengers? Again, there's a lot we don't know about how the train chooses its passengers. And I'll be talking about that in the part two video, but we do know a few things. Owen Dennis has answered multiple times online that the train appears to those who are at a crossroads in their life. These crossroads for the characters we see on the show manifest when the character's flaw causes them to make a mistake that they could either choose to learn from and grow or succumb to and continue down a bad path. For Tulip, she was unable and unwilling to accept change in her life, primarily in the form of her parents' divorce, which led her to run away from home after being unwilling to accept that she wasn't going to get to go to game design camp. For Jesse, he cared too much about what other people thought of him, and he wanted everyone to like him, which led him to give in to peer pressure, hurting the people he cared about the most. For Grace, she lashed out for attention and was needlessly cruel to others, all to protect herself from confronting her own feelings of fear and loneliness. And for Simon, though we don't see the events leading up to him getting on the train, but based off of how we see his number act, I'd say his flaw is always needing to be right and being too stubborn to listen to others to change his views, even if this comes at the cost of hurting everyone around him. The Infinity Train can change its appearance, seemingly based on the preference of the person it's approaching. And apparently, it can also alter the physical space around it. But the limitation appears to be that it has to stay a train. We also know, thanks to Owen and Maddie, that it's theoretically possible to have the train reveal itself to multiple people at the same time, which we've never seen in the show, but is super interesting. The only way off the train we are aware of is for a passenger's number to reach zero and their exit door appears, at which point the train will actually stop. And speaking of numbers, that's a perfect segue to part three. Part three, passengers and numbers. Book two gives us a lot of insight into what happens to a passenger after they're picked up by the train and how they get their numbers. First, the passenger in a sleeping stasis state is transported in a pod to the number car. Interesting to note that these pods are able to be repurposed, as done by Amelia in book one, to create her mech suit. 
The pods seem to come from this central location, but exactly where and how they drop off the passenger isn't seen. I also want to acknowledge these robots that seem to be programmed to handle passengers as they go through the number process. They resemble the steward, but they look like some kind of ostrich? One one seems to have full control over these guys though. Eventually, the passenger is put in the passenger farm, where their memories are extracted into a tape. Interestingly, the tapes are not actually VHS tapes, but rather magnetic tape data storage, which stores digital information on magnetic tape using a digital recording. This is an interesting choice, seeing as videotapes are usually analog, while data tapes are digital. What's also interesting about these tapes is that one one, being the true conductor of the train, has the ability to view and manipulate the playback of anyone's tape, which he does with Amelia's. During the scene, we also get a bird's eye view of how the data is stored, and it looks like it's supposed to be Amelia's brain. Once the memories are done being extracted, the passenger is sent through a series of tubes to the inside of the number car, where the robots assess the tapes and assign the passengers their number. One one refers to it as some kind of algorithm, but we don't know the exact formula. I also want to point out here that Owen and Maddie answered what would happen if a passenger theoretically didn't have a hand to place a number on, and that it would simply be placed on the next available skin, and that it doesn't necessarily need to go on the person's hand. Numbers seem to be assigned to a specific issue the passenger is facing, and also appear to be correlated to the severity of the issue itself. For example, we see an older male passenger who appears to be neglecting his family and also being generally awful in the workplace. He gets a rather high number, which Lake even comments on. Once assigned with a number, the passenger is again sent away via pod to a seemingly random train car to start their journey to bring their number down. I say seemingly random, but Tulip wakes up in the snow car and Jesse wakes up in the hill car, both of which are actually quite similar to what their homes look like. But since we've only seen this happen twice, I don't want to say that's definitively what the train was trying to do, but I thought it was worth mentioning. When they wake up, they are greeted with a video of the conductor, one one, explaining how the train works. But of course, this video wasn't there while Amelia took over as conductor. Now, I mentioned that the numbers seem to be assigned to a specific issue, and they seem to also only decrease when you make progress on that specific issue, and vice versa. Or as Lake calls it, each passenger has their own sad lizard story. I was gonna go in depth to how the numbers have worked for each passenger we see in the show, but it got very long and this video is already long enough, so I may do it in another video. But just as an example, we know that the issue Jesse needs to work on in book two is to not care what everyone thinks about him and to not succumb to peer pressure. By the time this flaw of Jesse's is clear to the audience, it makes perfect sense why his number isn't changing in the map car, even though Lake is challenging him in different ways. It's only when he's able to stand up for himself and his friends not caring about what Marcel thinks, that his number eventually goes down, since he learned a lesson that addresses the specific issue he needed to face. Also, a couple of fun facts that Owen and Maddie have answered on Reddit about numbers. If a mother were to give birth on the train, the baby wouldn't have the mother's number. Theoretically, if one one were the conductor, he may do something else with it, like send it home or take care of it himself. Also, numbers can go up seemingly infinitely, which we never get to see in the show, since the highest number we see is Simon's and he dies before it goes up any higher. A lot of people think that Simon died because his number was high, but I don't think that's true. I think he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Owen and Maddie have answered that numbers just get smaller and smaller and eventually go into your mouth, which to me is pretty freaky. Part four, the train cars. Earlier in the video, I already listed out all the cars that we see in the show, but here I want to talk about the function of the cars and how the train uses them to achieve its goal. Again, I want to go into the purpose of the train more in depth in another video, but for the sake of this video, let's say the train is trying to help passengers grow past their flaws by teaching them lessons. We know a bit about how the train designs these cars to achieve that goal. We're given a little insight thanks to Owen and Maddie on how the cars function and that the train cars aren't made for specific people. It's more like the train is trying to account for every possible experience that might help someone grow. What he says next is really wild, that this could theoretically mean that there could be other chrome cars, just with slight differences. Passengers also go through cars and meet denizens randomly, or in their words, it's closer to chance. The even scarier thing about this is that this also applies to finding cars with food in them. Gosh, Owen, how many people end up dying on this train? Owen and Maddie also talk about the function of the train in this video from last year, where they react to fan theories. 
In response to a theory about the train turning denizens that refused to help passengers into the gomes of the wasteland, Owen describes... The train, I think, is trying to be a good force. Yeah. While maintaining its own neutrality. Uh, denizens that are, you know, jerks were created by the train. Yeah. Still, you know. So it's kind of on them. So it's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of... It's kind of not fair. Kind of on the train. Yeah. But also, it's not like our show is fair. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> So train cars aren't meant to necessarily be good or bad, but they're meant to help the passenger grow, even if it's unfair to the passenger. We also do know a good amount about how the cars are actually made, thanks to Amelia. She was actually able to create cars through hijacking the train. Though she never achieved her exact goal, she did get pretty close, and in doing so, revealed a lot about how the train works. The mechanism is comprised of orbs, hidden behind panels that populate the environment in each car. We also know these orbs can be fitted into this cannon to change things on the train to whatever the orb is programmed for with a shot out beam. These cannons are also seen on the front of the train engine when it approaches Amelia, which she was able to repurpose. It seems that the only part of the process she wasn't able to succeed in was actually programming these orbs to create the living being she wanted, she only managed to find the orbs that would build the environment of the car she wanted. And when it came to the living beings, she kept accidentally making turtles. The closest she ever got was with Hazel. Side note, the orbs in 1-1 are also the same size. When it comes to solving the puzzles in the cars, we've seen a bunch of different ones solved in unique ways. But Owen and Maddie point out that there are actually multiple ways to solve puzzle cars. For example, in the colored clock car, if a passenger didn't have a colorblind denizen with them, then maybe Roy would help them. I find the idea of this really interesting, and I'd love to see any of the puzzles that we've already seen in the show be solved in a different way by a new protagonist. Part 5. Train Tech and Train Denizens There are two entities of the train that I want to address first, and that's the steward and 1-1. The steward appears to be for maintenance, and it's able to access the orbs and change the settings of a train car. It doesn't seem to have sentience on its own, and just takes orders from the conductor. It's also controlled through freaking, which was covered by Uncivilized Elk in one of his videos. I'll link to that video so you can hear more about it. One One is also a unique character that I think I want to do a whole separate video on, considering the length of this one already. All I'll say for now is that we know he's the true conductor of the train, and there is a lot of evidence that he was previously just called One with a single consciousness and then split into Glad One and Sad One at some point, possibly when Amelia initially removed him from his position. Some more evidence for this is that we also see Amelia's outfit in Book 3 that has a version of One One with just a single eye. And Amelia also refers to One One as just One. But Owen and Maddie refuse to elaborate for now. One more entity I want to discuss is one of the actual train denizens, and that's Samantha the cat. She's the most unique denizen we see in the show. She's the only one who outright explains the train to passengers she encounters. While she's not the only denizen we see move between cars, she appears to have multiple cars that are hers, or at least they have cat somewhere in the name. The cat's car seems to be her home car, but she also has these several outposts in other cars where she runs businesses or takes vacations. She also has a shuttlecraft that helps her travel between cars, which has a very unique style. The only thing similar is the device that Simon uses in Book 3 to help him find other passengers. The look of the shuttlecraft and Simon's passenger tracker are super similar, and as I said, unlike anything else we see on the train. We don't know anything about where this train tech comes from, but we do know Simon and Samantha have a former connection, but I'm getting dangerously close to theory territory right now. The only other thing I want to say about the train denizens is that, for all intents and purposes, they seem to be very much real, meaning they have their own sentience and live their own day-to-day -day lives on the train, which should be obvious to us by Book 3 as we learn more about Tuba. And of course, denizens retain their memories of passengers that they've helped in the past. I also want to point out a few fun facts about specific cars that we've seen in the show. The Corgi car is supposedly a democratically elected monarchy that probably has a process for who's in charge when Atticus is absent. 
Also, I cover the chrome car pretty extensively in my character analysis on Lake, which if you haven't seen, I'll link up in the corner right now for you to go check out. But another thing that Owen and Maddie have answered about this is that reflections are generally pretty dedicated to their jobs, which only further supports the argument I make in my other video. Also, Owen ominously questions whether the train actually created the mirror world, which Considering that the train is probably older than the human invention of mirrors, it seems totally plausible. Again, kind of freaky to think about. Part 6. Where is the infinity train? What is the wasteland? The last thing I want to touch on is one of the most mysterious elements of the show, and that's where the infinity train is located. You can bet I'll be talking more about it in the part 2 video, but we do know a couple of things. The Wasteland is a seemingly desolate, infinite expanse where the train is located, and the gomes live underground in. I don't think the Wasteland is on Earth, since the sky is literally red, but I don't have enough evidence to say this definitively. The gomes are the dog cockroach-like monsters that come out to attack passengers and denizens who try to leave the train, named that by the Apex. In Book 3, we figure out what happens when they actually get to you. They suck the life force out of you, causing you to basically melt until you're dead, and then they explode after. The only clue we get as to where the gomes come from is that after Amelia shoots Atticus with her repurposed cannon, he turns into one. But he's also able to be turned back, with the use of a corgi programmed orb in the cannon. Well, I think that just about covers it for everything that we know about the Infinity Train. Part 2 is going to be all the questions that I still have, so be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified for when that video comes out. Also, if I missed anything, leave a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your fellow Infinity Train fans. You can find me on Twitter and Twitch at YesAnnCovey. Lately on Twitch, I've been streaming a lot of the new Stardew Valley 1.5 update, so if that's something you're interested in, stop by and say hi! We can even chat about Infinity Train. Thanks so much for watching. I love you and appreciate you. Stay safe and take care.